because often we get stuck into our old identities. We have some issues, problems in childhood when we are younger, and we really only can heal from them when we let go of that identity. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's your host, Eileen. In today's episode, we cover brain health and how that relates to mental health and our emotional and physical well being. We talk about healing, positive psychology, and how to maintain a healthy and happy state of being. Our guest today is Inka Land. Inka is a psychologist with a master's in neuropsychology. She's a YouTuber, author, and educator, inspiring people for better mental and brain health and wellness. Inka has also been on a journey of healing from chronic pain. She draws from her knowledge and science and experience in healing to share actionable advice on wellness. Hi, Inka. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you doing? Hi, Eileen. I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you. I'm very honored to have this discussion with you today. Yeah, I'm excited. So why don't you start by telling us your story, how you got into brain health, mental health, and wellness? My story started, I would say, I guess, when I was a child, how I got into this space of brain health and mental health, because I was born with this chronic pain condition of chronic migraines. And I was a very severe case. So when I was six, I already got the diagnosis of chronic migraine, which basically (gasps) means that... Yeah. And that was only the diagnosis. And I was suffering from migraine for all my childhood. It's an inherited condition. My father has it. My grandmother has it. And chronic migraine basically means that you have migraine on 15 or more days a month, which means that I was basically in pain most of the time. And through my childhood, I went through several medications. We tried all this kind of medical treatments nothing really helped. And when I was a teenager, I just wanted to, you know, heal it. I just wanted to get better. And I started searching about brain health, about how to support nervous system. Of course, pain comes with a lot of mental health aspects, like you're anxious, you're kind of afraid your own body in a sense. You are afraid that you will get the pain Mm -hmm. you get these little micro moments of yes i got over the pain and then it comes back so you feel frustrated you feel sad so i knew that this is also part of the aspect that i need to work on a lot and so this is what like basically led me into studying psychology studying brain health studying neuropsychology and seeking natural solutions i tried so many medications when i was young and they didn't work for me and i've always been very into natural health And I just decided that I'm going to want to find out all the natural things that you can do to improve your mental health and brain health. And I was one of the lucky ones that actually got into migraine remission. So these days I get maybe one migraine a month, if even that, and it's very easy to handle. So that was the kind of like the the storyline that led me into this space. Right. And how long was that period? Like, when did you like get into remission? Like, when did you heal it? And how, how long were you studying and experimenting up to that point? Right, right. That's a good question. So I guess when I really started to embark on this journey of, I'm just going to heal it. I'm just going to do everything that I can. I was about 16, 17 at that time. And it took me about seven years to for my neurologist to tell me that you're in a remission and we will write you off from the outpatient clinic uh, that you are too healthy to be sort of like our patient Mm. and that's when I got the official kind of like release from the migraine Mm -hmm. and then there was this whole work on your identity my identity that now I need to really let go of the identity and that was where I think the mental health or the psychology part comes in because often we get stuck into our old identities. We have some issues, problems in childhood when we are younger and we really only can heal from them when we let go of that identity. 
Oh yeah. Oh, they, that's a totally other different topic. A quick question. You mentioned your dad also suffers from chronic migraines. So like, has he been able to like heal based on what you have learned and taught? Like, have you shared what you've learned? Yeah. yeah. He's become so much better. Like he uses a lot of the same tools that I use and he's a little bit uh, maybe slower to catch on to these new technologies and new things and, you know, kind of like more considerate about like, "Mm, let's wait before I try it. But he has taken so many things in his life and he also doesn't uh, get migraines anymore, but he also has a medication that works. So it's kind of like he uses both approaches. I see. Okay. So back on your healing journey, um, what were the biggest things that you learned? Like how, I guess the big things that you think changed things for you, or was it a lot of yeah. little things? <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell us, tell us what you think was happening. There were big things and little things. And I'm so glad you asked this because it was very surprising. What was the biggest thing, the first biggest thing that really helped me to start healing and start getting more positive that I can do this. So I remember this moment when I was about 16, I was sitting in the floor of my apartment in meditation. I have just decided that I'm going to try it. And of course, it took multiple times before I really got into the flow and before I started to get the zest of meditation. But at the time, I was actually having a migraine attack. I I had so much pain. I had eaten medication. I just like, nothing works. I was very, very frustrated. So I decided that I'm just going to sit in the floor and I'm just going to be. And usually this was a bit different because usually I would have wanted to just try to get rid of the pain or try to sleep or try to do something to mask the pain. This time I really just wanted to listen to it because I've tried meditation and I'm like, okay, you need to start listening what's going on in your body and mind and accept. So I tried this practice and all of a sudden I started noticing that the pain is going the way. And I was like, kind of like um, came out from the, from the state and noticed that the pain came back and mm-hmm. then went back into the meditation and noticed that the pain started to lower again. And I realized that this, this place where I was, was where, where I was just purely observing the pain. And previously I had been taking the pain in, feeling in it, suffering from it. So it was my thought. I was so focused on the pain and that I want to get rid of it. it. I didn't even focus on the fact that I don't have to pay that much attention to it or cling on to it, but I can just let it be kind of like a noise in the radio or mm-hmm. whatever car noises passing by. And I kind of found this state. So I realized that inside me, it's kind of like a room that that I am being and the light switch is off. So it's completely dark and I feel like I'm in a dark place. But then I found the light switch and I realized that the same room can be my, my home and my safety harbor if I can access the light, light switch. And I realized that the light, light switch is in that room. It's inside my body and it's inside my mind. I just need to find it. So that was the, the big, big thing that led me into taking meditation and I think meditation is one of the best things you can do if you have pain or any kind of anxiety depression self-doubt anything because you need the self-awareness first and you need the acceptance of anything that your body and mind is going through so that you can start observing it and then start healing it yeah instead of like trying to like ignore it or even run away from it you have to look at it like observe it and acknowledge it right exactly because this that's something that's in you and only you can take it away and only you can decide how you are going to focus on it or how you are going to yeah what's your attitude towards it so it's like almost like you know this manifest manifestation thing if you're thinking all the time i'm in pain i'm in pain i'm suffering that's what you are creating more mm. Yeah, But then if you turn the idea around, and I actually started training like this. So whenever I got pain, I started training this just mindfully observing the pain and then self-compassion. So just repeating to myself these phrases, you know, I am well, I am loved, I am happy, I'm in peace, my nervous system is healing, my nervous system is healthy. And it starts to transcend the pain experience. 
And sometimes I still got the pain, but it wasn't disturbing me that much. Uh, and after okay. that, I started using natural tools like sleep and diet and exercise and supplements and pretty holistic tools, as well as continuing the meditation. And all that then led into the um, getting to the remission. Wow. Amazing. So is that what you mean by like letting go of your pain identity to start healing? Is like, don't identify with your pain, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you need to turn the mindset of I'm suffering into I'm healing. And that's when you start healing. Okay. So it's, it's a simple shift, but it's like, it's a mindset shift. Yeah. It's a mindset shift and it's not always easy. Like it's, it's, um, it takes a little bit of work to believe it. Yeah. That you, you can do it. And I believe anyone can do it. I never thought when I was young that I would be in a migraine remission, really. And I, I was just thinking that if I get 50% less pain, I'll be happy. And now that I've gone through this journey, I'm really here to tell, you know, people that you can do and heal your body very holistically if you just believe it that is possible. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of people listening either experience or know someone experiencing some sort of like health thing, whether it's, you know, whether it's as simple as like anxiety or, or whether it's like a chronic pain or something deeper, how would you guide them to start healing? Like what are the first things that they need to do in order to start to even take those steps? Right. So one thing that I believe is the key of all basically life improvements and self-improvements and just having that um yeah getting into healing is this mindset of optimism and this comes from a positive psychology really that you can look at your life like i'm having tools in my in my hands to do whatever i want with my life if it's healing then i have the tools inside me to heal and you always have this kind of mindset that whatever happens it's some sort of a lesson that will take you further or you have a challenge and you feel like you have the self like um you have the power to overcome challenges so it's like really working on that optimistic mindset work first mm -hmm. because Study after study shows that if people don't have the value of uh, self-empowerment or that they don't feel like they have big self-esteem or not big self-esteem, but like um, the word that I'm looking for is like, um, I don't remember the word, but it's like this kind of optimistic mindset that if people don't believe that they can affect what happens to them, they are less likely to try things. <laughs> you can only get further with trying different things. And oh my God, how many hours it took me to go through different types of supplements, to different types of diets. It really wasn't that easy. But when the first diet didn't work out, I let it go and I went to the next one and I went to the next one. And the golden thread in this whole journey was my belief that I can affect my life, my health. And you have the power to heal your body. I think a lot of people, they try something and it doesn't work and then they the failure stops them, right? I think a lot of times people give up because it's too hard. They Maybe they've tried like three or four or five times and it, even after that failure, they're like, okay, I've tried everything. And so they stop. So, so you're saying it's just a mindset of like, you have to believe that you can heal so that you just, you're optimistic and you keep trying, right? Because I'm sure it's not easy in that journey. It's not easy. And there are ways in which you can work on this optimistic mindset. Like uh, psychological studies, for example, show that when people use affirmations, and I know that you have, for example, a very nice affirmation video in your channel, when people use this kind of self-affirmations of positive values that they believe in, they start behaving more towards their life, life goals. They start making more action and they, for example, start engaging in more health behaviors. Mm. So there are I things that, that you can do to work on work on your optimism. Mm -hmm. Because some people also, they have 
cling on to the identity that they have always had disappointments. So they say like, well, I'm just like, I just don't believe in life or like, I'm so pessimistic. I don't know how I'm supposed to even be optimistic. So then it's just to work on that attitude first and then start taking the steps. Yeah. I appreciate that you say that because I do love using affirmations. I make those videos, but it's nice to hear it from like a scientist and someone who studies the science behind mental health and all, like psychology to affirm that it actually works. Because a lot of people are like, oh, you're just faking it. It's a lie. It, people find it hard to believe a thought that isn't true in their mind. So I think it's trusting that you can change your mind, you can change your psychology because it's proven to work. Yeah, exactly. And I love that you said that uh, people uh, like I have hard to hard times to believe it's a thought that is not in their head. Mm -hmm. So one thing that may help, and I learned this from a psychologist, Dr. Gay Hendricks, who have written the book Big Leap, uh, which is a very excellent book as well to read if you want to work on this attitude. But he says that you can write the affirmations in your own voice and even record the affirmations in your own voice and then play them back to yourself and repeat them. So it's more believable for you because it comes from your own mind. But of course, the affirmation needs to be positive. Yeah. Okay. So... Tell us about brain health and how this connects with mental health. What do you mean by brain health and how do we, you know, keep our brains healthy? Brain is an organ that I think gets very little attention considering how big of an impact it has our mood. It's basically the seed of our whole perception of the world. Our mood, our behavior, our cognition, memory, focus, concentration, even like if we pay attention, how, how we see things, what kind of colors we see, it's, it's like creates everything. And it also controls other organs in our body. Like it controls heartbeat and gut motility and everything through vagus nerve, which is a long nerve that runs from the brain to internal organs. So it basically, it defines our mental health in the sense that if you have brain inflammation, for example, so you can have inflammation in the brain, similarly, then you can have inflammation in your gut, for mm. example. And if you have that, you are you have more neuronal excitation and you have most likely more anxiety or you may have depression because of the inflammation in the brain. So there is some sort of biological imbalance and you can have hormonal imbalance in the brain, like you can have a hormonal imbalance in your body, um, different levels of neurotransmitters, and brain health affects aging, of course. If we don't take care of our brain health, we will have we will age faster and have shorter lifespan. Wow. And what's funny is we talk so much about mental health and our minds. And yet this is, it's very, it is rare that we talk about the health of our brains because it could be like a biological issue or whether you're not getting certain vitamins or I don't know. So, so I appreciate bringing you onto the podcast to talk about this. Like a very simple example of this is just if you are not getting enough sunlight every day, you feel most likely depressed a little bit. You feel like more sluggish. You feel like you want to snack more. You feel like less meaning of life, less life satisfaction. And this is most likely because your brain is not creating a lot of serotonin because serotonin turnover initiates when your eyes get exposed to sunlight. Mm -hmm. So just looking at the morning sunlight for 5 to 15 minutes each morning will significantly increase your serotonin production for the day. And also that shifts the circadian rhythm. So that helps you sleep in the night. So that's linked to your evening production of melatonin. And if you don't get that morning sunlight, you're actually having poorer sleep next night, which of course, if we get poor sleep, that's also going to lead to stress and anxiety. Yeah, it's all connected. <laughs> so every morning, get some sunlight in your eyes for five to 10 minutes, <laughs> like go outside. This is one of the biggest findings in neuroscience recently. And now every neuroscientist and mental health expert is just, you know, making a big point out of this because sunlight in the morning affects in so many things in mental health and brain health. Tell us more about what you wish everyone knew about brain health. Like what else should we know and what else should we be doing? 
Right. Oh, this is very interesting. So I recently ran into this article. We all know that exercise is very healthy, right? But now recently there there was this article that shows that specific types of exercise might be specifically good for different types of mental health issues. So for example, if someone's very anxious, then resistance training might be the best exercise modality for them. So lifting weights at the gym, for example, doing body weight exercises or something like that. If you are having depression, then multimodal exercise might be the best. So some sort of body-mind exercise, some sort of uh, aerobic exercise, most likely because that increases uh, BDNF, for example, in the brain, which is linked to depression risk. So uh, aerobic exercise like running, dancing, Zumba, whatever makes you feel uh, like glad and want to do it more. And then some uh, a little bit of resistance training. So with depression, you want to get all types of exercise. And then with PTSD, for example, or this kind of like chronic stress, body-mind exercises were the most efficient. So like yoga and pilates or tai chi or something like that. So that's very interesting because for me, it shows that there is a clear link between how the exercise affects the brain and how it actually connects to the mental health. So for example, if you go to the gym to lift weights, there has been studies showing that this trains the prefrontal cortex in the brain and this area of the brain. So it's just before, uh, just below, sorry, behind your forehead. So this is the area that actually controls your emotional senses in the brain. So Mm -hmm. if you get anxious or uh, fearful or something, you want to engage your prefrontal cortex. And that's Uh, exactly what resistance training does to your brain. Interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. It it is super interesting. And I, I love that now we have more precise tips on what kind of exercise to try in certain mental health issues. Well, then if you have depressed mood or sadness, it's often linked to certain imbalances in the nervous system. So you may find it hard to kind of initiate your your dopamine and your mo- motivation and thrive. So for that, for example, um, treadmill or running or even yoga is very beneficial because it also usually includes some sort of breathing exercises which then mm. help to improve dopamine and that all cheers up your mood as well. It's also very effective for, I, I mentioned BDNF, so that's brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which basically makes your hippocampus grow and brain grow. So it's the hormone that helps to create new neurons and grow the brain cells. Okay. So that mechanism is also linked to easing depressive symptoms and becoming happier getting better mood, better motivation. Okay, so you said it's BDNF? What is it? BDNF. Okay, so what else um, helps that part of your brain grow? (laughs) What else can you do to promote that? Right, so uh, different vitamins and minerals. For example, eating blueberries have been shown to be very effective. So getting a lot of phytonutrients from different berries, different vegetables, basically a nutrient-rich diet, DHA is very good. So this is omega-3 fatty acid that you get from fish and seafood. Or kelp, like seaweed, are one of the most known, the best brain foods that you can get, really. And um, vegetables and fruits, as I mentioned. Yeah. So you're saying all of these things that you can do, whether it's the exercise or the foods, it nourishes our brain in a way. Because when you, you were talking about how like creating new neurons, like when you're trying to change your mindset, don't you want to like create new people say, what's it called? Like creating new paths in your yeah, neurons. Neuroplasticity. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Right. Well, you are exactly on point on that one. Um, like neuroplasticity and improving these pathways that are often linked to neuroplasticity is usually linked to, first of all, uh, mood improvement. Mm. But second of all, also the shift of mindset, because you get more tools to kind of think differently. And this is so important also for just general health and longevity. And if you get a brain injury, for example, uh, 
if you have done things that improves your neuroplasticity, then you get a brain injury and you lose some part of the brain. So for example, I worked, uh, I did my clinical internship with brain injured patients. So people who have more neuroplasticity, they have more tool tools and neural connections, they may be able to compensate of some lost mm. skill with another skill or, no, or another thought pattern. So neuroplasticity is one of the most exciting things. It works with different mechanism. It's like growing new brain cells. It's uh, growing new branches of the brain cells. And yeah, it's uh, recently it has been even shown that human brain generates new neurons as well. Wow. Okay. No, that's really helpful because I think a lot of people try to make changes in their life, but some people struggle more than others. And so you're, it, it's, it brings in like the science physical aspect where like you can change your diet, you can change your, you can exercise more so that you have better tools, like you said, to, to change who you are and to change your, your brain and your, or your mindset in a way. Oh, totally. And I believe that this kind of holistic approach to let's say goal setting or want to achieving some dream want to make changes is the best way it just makes everything so much easier so i would say for example for my nervous system when i was suffering from migraine there is a certain like our nervous systems and mind and brain they kind of wire in a certain way so i did not only have to manage that inflammation in the nervous system and that pain but also that automatic wiring that was creating the pain in certain situations. And I believe that the fact that I did like a holistic approach was the key. Before, when I was just trying the medications or some one tool, it didn't really work that well. But when I did the holistic approach, everything started to transcend. Everything started to shift and it started to shift fast. So one key, as I told, for neuroplasticity is exercise, just changing habits, trying different things all the time, um, food and sleep. Sleep is pretty much the number one, actually, in neuroplasticity, because during the sleep, our brain is regenerating. It's actually practicing the information that you have been doing in the day. Mm hmm. And that's why people may say also that do positive affirmations or self-affirmation or planning of the life in the evening because the brain is practicing more of the things that you have been doing in the evening mm. because the memory is fresh for them. And oh, you go yeah. to a sleep and then it kind of rewires this information and makes it consolidate to your brain. Wow. Yes. I, I've experienced that. I it's, I love to do affirmations before I sleep or sometimes if there's a problem or some, a project I'm working on at night, it's like, I feel like I'm dreaming about it. And then when I wake up, I have the solution because I, my brain was working while I was sleeping. Yeah, exactly. That's amazing. I want to know about your daily and weekly routine since now you've learned so many things. I have, you have so much knowledge. So what are the things that you do consistently? Right. So I have a pretty set routine. Well, me and my husband, we travel a lot, but when we are at home, we're just repeating the same things. So we wake up, we actually take red light therapy. Do you know red light therapy? So these red light lamps. Um, Is it a big have, lamp? Yeah, this kind of full body red okay. light lamp. Yeah, I've seen and that. It gave us red and infrared light and it just has like healing properties. So it improves the mitochondria, cellular renewal, mm -hmm. mitochondria functioning, energy production, everything. I come into my kitchen, I drink water, I do some yoga, some meditation. I usually make a cup of coffee and I come to my workroom and I open the window. So I don't always go out to see the sunlight. I usually open the window in the workroom and just let the sunlight inside the room. And uh, this is already a lot of things for the brain. That is very helpful, like hydration, movement in the morning. Movement in the morning is very good for BDNF, actually. And meditation in the morning is just good for you to get prime your mind, sort of be very mindful about your nervous system and your breathing for throughout the whole day. And um, then you get the sunlight. Then I start working. I really find it effective, like at this kind of deep work in the morning. I usually don't open social media in the morning. 
because it kind of distracts my mind. And we can talk about the dopamine thing as well, you know, that that's affecting the dopamine. Um, I usually take a cold shower actually before the work as well. And then, yeah, depending on how the day flows, I eat, I eat lunch. I take a walk in the park somewhere during the day. We go to the gym in the afternoon and we come home. Sometimes we do sauna uh, because we have sauna at home in oh, here nice. where we live. Yeah, here where we live, everyone has a sauna in their house. Like in Finland, oh. we have more saunas than cars. We live in Estonia. <laughs> we also have a lot of saunas here. Oh, I so, see. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very typical thing here. So we take sauna, we eat dinner, and then after dinner, we start kind of unwinding and just dim the lights. So mm-hmm. light optimization is another thing that you can really, really do to support your brain because the production of melatonin, which is the sleep hormone. So many people struggle with sleep these days. And the sleep hormone production is really initiated when you dim your light. So you need quite dark atmosphere or at least block the blue light that comes from screens like mm. monitors phones so you may you use blue light blocking glasses or use blue light mm-hmm. blocking filters in computer so this is like the daily routine and then i try to get you know eight hours of sleep each night which i'm usually pretty successful i was having major sleep problems when i was studying at the uni for example but when i started my supplement regime, uh, the light optimization, the the workouts, it just got so much better. Yeah. It seems like in your day, you're giving yourself everything you need, like from the movement to the light, to the food and vitamins and everything. It's, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, let's talk about supplements because I know you talk about a lot of different ones on your YouTube channel. There's a lot of I think for the average person, they don't really know about, it can get overwhelming with all the information, all the different types of supplements that are out there, like from the natural, I I don't know if all of them are natural, but things like lion's mane, adaptogens, like all these new words that we're learning. So help guide us through that. What are your favorite supplements? What should we all know about? I think supplementing needs to be very individual. So it depends on what you're trying to optimize and improve. Some things that I think is even more complicated is when we are women and we have our cycle, then we need different nutrients and supplements in different types of the, or in different times of the cycle. But I would say almost everyone will benefit from magnesium. Magnesium is a super common deficiency and it's very safe natural supplement or it's, it's a mineral that gets excreted in our bodies when we sweat you know work out do sauna drink coffee if we just live life if, if we have stress stress increases the need for magnesium and magnesium calms the nervous system especially if you have anxiety or stress magnesium is actually working in the level of neurons in the brain and it it blocks this kind of excessive uh, neuronal firing. And other that I think everyone will benefit from unless they eat fish each day is fish oil or seaweed because that contains that high amounts of DHA, which is is very good for mood. It's highly essential actually maintaining good mood. So if you have any depression, any sad mood, then DHA would be probably very beneficial. I use a lot of supplements to manage my migraine. So some of the things that help for me is probably not very applicable applicable to everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, But for those who deal with migraine, yeah, you can share it. Right. So CoQ10, so coenzyme Q10, ubiquinol, magnesium, ginger, curcumin. Actually, ginger or curcumin are very good for anyone who have any kind of inflammation, inflammation in the gut, in the joints. They are naturally anti-inflammatory and they have been studied a lot. Um, then NAC and acetylcysteine is one that works for migraine as well and vitamin Ds. And vitamin Ds are something that's also very important for mood, mood maintenance. So many women, especially uh, may benefit from vitamin Ds if they have lack of energy, fatigue, because they help a methylation process. They help basically cells to use other vitamins for energy production. 
So those supplements are some of my favorites. Then I use nootropics for cognitive work. So people who are like looking to sharpen their brain before intense work. I actually really like lion's mane. As you mentioned, that one, lion's mane has been shown to contain compounds that affect this BDNF. But for me, what I've noticed, it really helps to improve energy. And I use something that's called adaptogens. These are help herbs and supplements that help to improve energy levels without caffeine. Mm -hmm. So they basically the definition is that they improve non-specific stress management response. Um, So they basically improve your energy levels. I think that's the simplest and most logical explanation on that. Um, They include like uh, ginseng, ashwakanda, rhodiola rosea. Some of these are even too stimulating for me even though i drink coffee i don't get even that stimulated from coffee that i get like rhodiola yeah so i think you just really need to try them out and see which one works for you i like coffee with l-theanine for uh, focus as well okay so for things like adaptogens and things that seem like they're just herbs like can you overdo them or can they be bad for you (laughs) sort of thing or does it just benefit everyone in general because I, I just see them everywhere and they're added into like new drinks and stuff I'm just curious yeah you can overdo them for <laughs> sure and I wouldn't just start like popping the supplements a lot of them without reading about mm-hmm. the dosages and I also always advise to keep a little breaks sometimes so like ashwagandha for example use for a month or two and keep equally long break from that Supplements, I mean, they are generally safe. Usually they don't sell anything that wouldn't be safe for humans, but they the dose is there for a reason. And someone who is highly sensitive, like I am, like I have extra sensitive nervous system, I find that just taking half a dose might work for me very well. And if I take the full dose, then I just feel anxious and agitated. So sometimes we may not realize that the supplement that we are eating is actually causing us more anxiety. And that's what we were trying to optimize. So we really need to, I think breaks really help to see if it was actually the supplement that was not working for us that well. Yeah. Um, Okay, let's talk about the difference between dopamine and serotonin and how that affects, you know, the, the issues, the main issues you see in mental health, for example, social media. Right. So dopamine and serotonin are two neurotransmitters that get quite a lot of attention in mental health space. We have several neurotransmitters, but these two, because they have a big impact, big in, impact on our mood and, as you said, mental health. So dopamine is this kind of um, mot- motivational neurotransmitter that increases our movement, our thrive, our wanting to do this. It kind of gets you into this let's do this mode. But it's also linked to rewards. Mm. And your brain starts producing dopamine through learning process. So one of a very clear example is sugar. So we eat a piece of chocolate, our brain produces more dopamine, and we learn that that dopamine, which gave us now energy and motivation, came from the chocolate. So now we start to like create more chocolate. And if we eat chocolate very often, that increases our tendency and our wish to eat more chocolate. So there are certain things that increase dopamine very fast. Chocolate, coffee may do that. Um, Social media, shopping, Mm. anything that gives us fast pleasure. Why it's linked to motivation and work as well is that usually success at work gives us dopamine as well. Mm -hmm. So if we use too much of things that gives us fast dopamine that's not getting us anywhere like social media whereas it might be entertaining and make us feel good um, it does make our dopamine sort of spike a lot and when dopamine spikes it comes down also and it goes below the baseline levels before it comes back up before it sort of restores you know it's kind of like with energy or something if you go to the gym you work out you have a lot of energy but then you kind of get into this fatigue and you need to restore it and if you go to the gym all the time all the time all the time you get into chronic fatigue Mm. 
mm. and over overtraining. Same with dopamine. If you just like increase dopamine, get these fast fast dopamine spikes all the time, you kind of get fatigued. The brain gets fatigued, and then you are you end up being in a dopamine deficiency, actually in a deficient state. And now you need to take a very long break to mm. restore back your dopamine, and you you may feel depressed. You may feel like I don't want to do anything. I just want to lay in bed, and I don't want to socialize. I don't want to move. And that's usually a dopamine deficiency. Serotonin, whereas dopamine is this kind of energizing, motivating hormone, serotonin is more calming. It makes us feel content and happy, uh, but it's inhibitory more than excitatory. So it actually makes us feel calm. And this neurotransmitter, they usually work quite well together as well. So something that we go into the exercise that would increase both serotonin and dopamine. And the balance of this neurotransmitter is often cited when we talk about mental health. So a lack of either of these may cause some uh, mental health problems, like uh, lack of dopamine is often linked to depression, linked to feeling low energy, Low motivation. Yeah, as I mm-hmm. describe, it's kind of like the state where you are just in a bed and you don't want to do anything. Whereas lack of serotonin is more like you're irritable and you're anxious and you're like startling and you're it's actually because serotonin is also linked to social coaffiliation and social cooperation. If you have lack of serotonin, you might feel that people just annoy you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're not that you don't feel it connected whereas yeah high dopamine or like healthy levels of dopamine feel like you have the motivation you have enthusiasm you have a drive to do things that you want to do and enough serotonin feels like you're calm content happy you have good sleep um, your digestion is flowing well serotonin actually has a lot of um, effects on our body to our heartbeat, to our breathing, to our gut motility, uh, to our body temperature, and things like that. So even with your example with the dopamine deficiency, like if you're doing, for example, if you're constantly on social media, you're getting that dopamine, those dopamine hits of like, oh, exciting thing, exciting thing, and you end up in a deficiency. It seems like most people's lifestyle will lead them to a deficiency because there's so much distraction. There's so many things that where we can get too much dopamine, I guess. So yeah, how do you, how do you see that? And what can we do to stay balanced? Right. That's an excellent question because there are pretty much two types of way to get dopamine. One is the maladaptive one where you just get those hits and end up into a deficiency. And the other one is to get this steady increase in dopamine. And usually that requires doing something effortful first. So exercise increases dopamine, but that's not a bad way to get dopamine because you actually need to do something effortful first. Usually something that's hard at first and gives the pleasure after, then that gives this kind of more sustainable Mm. and healthy level of dopamine. So exercise, that's why people use cold showers, for example, in the morning, if they want the morning dopamine rather than social media. So social media would give you that like a snap of dopamine that will dip soon. But cold showers is actually very unpleasurable. uh, Yeah, very uncomfortable. You go into the cold shower, you feel like this is horrible. I want to get out. But then the dopamine that comes after, it feels very good after, like super refreshing. And then you just feel mental clarity. And it's shown that the dopamine is increasing at least up to two hours mm. after you take a cold shower. So something that, yeah, takes a little bit of effort. That's usually a good way to get dopamine. Okay. Another good way to balance the dopamine is to do calm pleasures. So... Walking to nature increases dopamine, but it doesn't increase as much as something like show, shopping or, you know, social media. I mean, we all probably want to use social media and shop and thing. Don't do that at all. But if you find yourself in a state where you're chronically doing that 
And if you are not doing that, you feel less meaning and less purpose and less motivation, then your dopamine might be dependent on that method. And you want to contemplate on maybe I should, instead of going into the social media right now, maybe I should do a 10 minutes of yoga and get my dopamine from that exercise, from that movement. Maybe I should go out to have a 15 minute walk into nature and get my dopamine from that. It doesn't feel as fast. It's a bit more effortful, but it's so much healthier. And I can guarantee that that's going to make you feel so much better for the long run. Yeah, that's a really good way to kind of dis- kind of, uh, I guess, identify what would be healthy and what's not healthy is like unhealthy hits of dopamine are easy, low effort, and it's it's kind of it's not helping you, right? But like you want to do things that take more effort, things that are a little bit harder, but still give you like a sense of satisfaction after doing it. Right, exactly. And just being mindful about, um, you know, why you don't want to stop scrolling social media, for example. And that is because it causes a little dip in dopamine when you put it away. And that feels, for most of us, that feels a little bit painful, yeah. Or at least sad, like, ah, oh, the fun is over. Yeah. But learn to anticipate that. You're like, okay, I'm going to feel this. It's okay. It'll pass in like one minute. And after that, I'm going to be happy again. I just need to put this phone away right now. And already that mindfulness on that action makes it so much easier to let go of that habit. What about serotonin? How do we stay balanced? What are the healthy things to do? Right. So I mentioned sunlight. So sunlight, I think sunlight is such an underappreciated, you know, natural tool for so many things. It has such good effect. It improves serotonin, vitamin D, everything. One thing we also need to do is eat carbs for serotonin Mm. because carbs actually help. So that's interesting. Serotonin is made from tryptophan that comes from food that are usually found in things like oatmeal or banana or turkey or milk. And when you eat that, you have a lot of proteins, amino acids in your body. But when you get carbs, you get rays of insulin that actually helps to shuffle other amino acids to muscles and your serotonin gets easier or tryptophan gets easier access to the brain where it's made into serotonin. So eating things that I mentioned, oatmeal, banana, protein, make sure to get your protein, um, doing exercise, getting the sunlight and sleeping well. Those would be very good ways to balance the serotonin. Also social connection. It's also such an important mental health tool, like just cultivating loving, good uh, connections with the people that you love like taking the time each day to maybe connect with a friend or call your mom or you know i don't know hug your dog yeah. i notice you have the yeah i know he, he, he does give me a lot of serotonin <laughs> each day yes. yeah oh. exactly so just connections and mm-hmm. having these kind of you know interesting inspiring discussions yeah uh, like i mean this is giving me so much serotonin right now Uh, making sure to get these micro moments of social connection each day unfortunately social media doesn't doesn't do that so the studies show that social media is not as effective way to get the feeling of connection as real connections yeah i i love how everything you're saying is like it's it's almost like common sense. Like you're like, oh, like that makes a lot of sense that you would get serotonin. You would get happy from all these, you know, social connection and sunlight. But I appreciate that it's it's literally been studied. Like it's scientific and it's, it's a fact that it, these things work. Yeah. And unfortunately, we seem to be so busy that Things like nature connection or getting a daily walk outside is is not that common anymore for most of the people. And also, you know, as of COVID, people have started working more at the home. So we don't get this natural exposure to social connections anymore. And many people feel lonely these days because also we replace like real social connections and going out for a coffee with a friend in with scrolling social media. Yeah which seems to contribute to depression rates and mental health problems. So we just need to kind of 
get back into the essence of what it is to be a human, which I feel is to have a community, to have connections, to have connect with nature and with people and realize that we are all like this huge community, uh, this unity. And, you know, used to use that as our mental health support. And also when we, you know, we can always think that when we are connecting with a friend, we are not only improving our own well-being, but we are also improving theirs. And when they feel happier, they also share happiness. So it's like a ripple effect of health. Definitely. Like we need each other and we help each other in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to ask you about longevity because that's also something that you study. I mean, it's, I know it's all interconnected, but what are some things specifically that promote longevity? That's a good question. Oh my God, this is such an interesting field. I'm so happy that you asked. So there are many things. So we can talk about the biological things that promote longevity, which would be just lowering inflammation, remaining insulin sensitive. So not eating too high sugar, not getting toxins in your body, uh, exercising. The BDNF is actually a longevity protein as well that improves your mood and neuroplasticity. So exercising is one of the best tools. One of the things that I find super interesting is cultivating meaning and purpose and having social connections. So people who feel meaning and purpose in their lives actually live longer. and. I don't know if, if you're familiar with Viktor Frankl's book, The Man's Search for Meaning. It's one of the most, I think, mind-blowing books that I've read. So Viktor Frankl is this Austrian psychiatrist who were at the Auschwitz concentration camp. And while he was there, he was studying and observing people. And he was basically observing what are the qualities in the people who were most likely to survive from this devastating condition you know where it's probably one of the it's probably the worst destiny you can have to being trapped and your, all your humanity is taken away and you basically have no reason to live while you're there and some of the people survived and in this book he tells about these stories and how he noticed that those were who were surviving, who were the most likely to be survived, is that they had some bigger meaning in life. For one, it might be that I want to write this big book when I get out of here, or I'm loving my family so much, like I want to go home and contribute to my family and like just love my family. For some person, it was something else. I want to leave a heritage to my grandchildren in the form of knowledge and wisdom. I want to share all my knowledge with the world. Whatever it was, was what was their sort of personal life goal or project. That was, was what was keeping them alive. Mm-hmm. And I feel like finding the meaning of, like often we get like a little bit stuck on, oh, what should I eat to live long? You need to have the reason to live in the first place, to eat, to move, to do any of those other stuff. So I think it's very powerful to contemplate on your on your goals and your life purpose. Wow. That's really insightful. That and it makes so much sense. You need to have like a strong why. Like why are you living? Why what do you want to do with your life in order to to live long? It is and it also goes back to like it's a mindset. It's a I choose to believe I can live long. Like I there was this book I read called like I forgot what it's called, but it was something like I will live to 120 years. Uh, I don't know. It's basically like the idea is if you assume or believe that you're going to live to 120 years old, then by the time you're 60, you're only halfway through. It's like, it's, it's setting that anchor, like having that mindset of like, oh, I believe I'm going to live that long and I have a reason for it. I have a purpose for it. What, for what you want to do with your life. And, and that does help you live longer. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So reason and purpose is like, Probably one of the biggest psychological things that you can cultivate. The other one is social connection. And it's interesting because me and my husband, we have been looking at these studies of 
the relative risk of mortality, like what is the chance that you will die at any given moment, which sounds horrible, but like that's <laughs> how they calculate it. So, for example, with exercise, to reduce this risk from 15 to 50 percent. And with uh, different practices like sleep, you can reduce it by 40 percent or with sauna mm. with 46 percent. Wow. Having the sense of social support and social connection, it's anywhere between like 30 to 60 percent. So, of course, this also comes down to, let's say you are feeling sick and ill, you have someone to support you and calm down your nervous system and say that it's going to be all good. Like when I was suffering with from pain, one of the biggest healing things for me was when, like, for example, my mom was holding my hand and just being there and being like, it's going to, you have got through it, you have went through this so many times, it's going to get better soon. And that called my nervous system and that helped me to calm down. And of course you get, it's the word I'm looking for, like concrete support. So let's say you're sick, your friend might bring you some medicine or some throat medicine or food or warm soup. Or if you fall, there will be someone to call an ambulance. So this as well, but just the feeling of also connection. And I feel like it also brings meaning to life. That's a nice reminder because you forget. I I feel like people overlook that, the social part of it. It's kind of like when someone brings you soup when you're sick, it's not really, yes, the soup helps, but it's the fact that someone made it, thought of you and brought it to you that is the social connection aspect. So it, it is healing. It's much more than just soup itself. It's right. So you just reminded me because that's something that it, it, it is overlooked. Like just someone telling you like it's going to be okay, just that emotional support can make so much of a difference. Yeah, like how much better does a chicken soup taste yeah. when it's not ordered from work, but actually your roommate made it for you yeah. and be like, oh, you're sick, I made you homemade soup. Mm-hmm. You're like, it doesn't even have to taste good. It still tastes <laughs> good because it's made for you by yeah. someone who cares about you. And of, yeah. also... Likewise, if you do these kind of acts of kindness, you know, to other people, mm. you're you're not only going to make them feel better, but yourself as well. And mm. as I told before, like I think this is a ripple effect thing. Oh, definitely, amazing. Um, I did have one question. I've been curious. You mentioned like in Finland, everyone has sauna. Like, so do you guys use it every day? Is it what are the benefits that you can share with us? Because it is more rare in other parts of the world. It is, yeah. And I I never even realized how rare it is other parts of the world. When I was growing up, like I thought every country has sauna everywhere because it's so common in Finland. Every house literally has it. Um so yeah, I mean usually every day, every other day, at least three times a week, a normal family would wow. use sauna. And it's very integral and deep part of the culture. We actually made a video with my husband uh, about sauna use and all the health benefits and how you can use sauna to improve your lifespan and longevity and brain health. And we also discussed some of the cultural habits. Like, you know, in Finland, if we have some celebration like Christmas, we have a Christmas sauna. Oh my gosh. So sauna <laughs> is also part of all of the celebrations. Uh-huh. And usually when you go to visit someone, if it's like a dinner or evening, they might just ask like, oh, would you like to go to the sauna? Wow. Which is like, would be strange in some uh-huh. other parts of the world, but in Finland, it's very normal. It's just like another place to hang out and it's healthy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So we're getting close to the end of the episode. What is one like message that you would like to leave our listeners with today? That's a big question. I would say that your thoughts really make up your reality. So if you believe that you are healing, if you believe that you can achieve anything, if you believe that you're going to the right path, you are. You just need to talk to yourself in that positive tone that's going to take you there. And if you have any doubt or any negative self-talk that you're stuck on, then there is always ways to work on it. And I believe anyone can develop this mindset of optimism and positivity and through that achieve pretty much anything in their life. 
lives. And I think I'm a living proof of that with my own healing journey. And that's, that's how I, that's why I know it. And uh, not only because of the studies, but because I've experienced something like that. And if I can do it, I, I think like, because I'm a human and we're all humans and we can all do it. Yeah. I think your story is amazing. And and thank you for just affirming so much of what I have learned and what I, I share what you, you know, similar to what you've shared today, I also share about it, but you share about it from the scientific point of view. So I really appreciate that you bring that aspect. So thank you so much for sharing today. Oh, lastly, where can we find you online? Oh, thanks for asking. And first of all, Eileen, I so much appreciate what you're putting out there. Like you do such an important work and I'm very privileged and honored to be here talking with you today. So thank you so much for having me. And um, if people want to follow me or find my content, I'm in YouTube. My account is at I am Inkaland. My Instagram has the same handle at I am Inkaland. And those are basically the two main um, main channels that I'm currently giving out information and it's all free at the moment. I have a newsletters as well. And yeah, that, that's the best way to find it. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Everyone definitely check out Inkaland to learn more about brain health, mental health, and how you can just create your dream life along with these, you know, these areas. Thank you so much. Thank you.